Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Maladumim in Israel. We live in an age of great technological advances. As recently as seven, 70 years ago, the computer, for all practical purposes, didn't exist. The television had only recently been invented. 100 years ago, there was no such thing as radio. Another half century before that, nobody had electricity. Around that time, the only motorized transportation was in the form of coal-burning trains and boats. A few decades earlier, even those didn't exist. But for the 5,000 years from the invention of writing until the invention of the printing press in the mid-15th century, hardly anything that we would deem of note was invented. This is quite amazing. What was everybody doing during that vast span of time? It seems to us that they were basically doing nothing, or at best, the same thing over and over again. However, we know from history that this was simply not the case. That entire period of several millennia was filled with changes, whether cultural or technological. The reason we don't see it that way is that the changes that were taking place don't seem all that relevant to us today. A significant change today might be something involving the interface of the smartphone. People before the present might have seen such a thing as quite amazing, but totally irrelevant to their lives. Similarly, we see whatever changes they went through as fairly insignificant since the results don't matter all that much to us. In a sense, we constantly live in, in a kind of temporal bubble in which we believe that whatever is important now is all that has ever been important and everything else could be bottled up and placed in a small package. This is why we think that anything of importance, at least technologically, has been created in the recent past. The more we get absorbed in, into our bubble, the more restricted our period of relevance becomes. For, for instance, those who are totally wrapped up in the all-consuming world of social media and the latest tech advancement tend to see all else as the epitome of useless. It is difficult for them to imagine that somebody as recent as their great-grandparents would likely see what they consider to be everything as utter triviality. It is not just with inventions and technology that this is the state of things. In practically all matters, it is not easy to see, th see things in any other the way than the way we see them now. Take, for instance, social relations. We have our systems in place, which we consider to be the way things should be done. 20 years ago, the primary method we use for interacting socially, namely social media, barely existed. There was email, but it pales in comparison to what we have today. A couple of decades more, and we don't even have that. We had to speak directly to another person, or else communication was delayed by what would now be deemed an interminable amount of time. But we do, what we do is what we consider normal, and anything else is deemed primitive. When it comes to something even more personal, like marriage and family, this is, there, it's also going through radical changes. It is entirely possible that these institutions will not exist in any form that would have been recognizable to previous generations within one generation. That's how fast things are changing. We don't know what the future is going to bring, but unlike all times in the past, we know that it won't be very similar to what is happening today. There may be no such thing as marriage or family. We probably won't even miss it. But marriage has forever been a part of society. There is no known society in which it didn't exist. What will we do if and when it doesn't? But even something as constant as marriage has changed considerably since ancient times. What we consider normal for a marriage was not so 100 years ago. The roles of men and women, of husband and wife, were quite different from what they are today. We can get a glimpse of this from this week's Parsha. The Parsha is called Naso. That simple word means lift, which in this case is a biblical of saying notice, referring to a certain family of Levites who were to be counted and assigned their tasks in the sanctuary. The details of this don't really concern us right now, as is the case for the first third of the Parsha. It's a long Parsha, actually the longest in the Torah. It contains many different subjects that seem to have nothing to do with each other. The final third of the Parsha is this long series of offerings that were to be brought by the representatives of each tribe in honor of the dedication of the tabernacle. But we are going to focus on something that comes at the beginning of the second third. It is a fairly long section and it deals with the matter that many people consider rather strange. The subject is what is known as the Sota, 
commonly translated as the adulterous wife. The section is hard to understand, both in terms of what is actually happening and what it all means. Sticking strictly to the text and ignoring the classic rabbinic interpretation, we can describe things in a fairly straightforward manner. It concerns the procedure of a married woman who was suspected by her husband of, of committing adultery. The Torah says that she did lie with the man behind her husband's back. In addition, there were no witnesses to the act. The Torah makes it absolutely clear that this was an immoral act and among the most serious. It also makes it clear that this wasn't a rape. Then the Torah describes the husband's emotional stake, saying that in a fit of jealousy, he accuses her, but leaves things un unclear as to whether she is truly guilty of genuine adultery. The procedure for this situation, in which, in which the husband isn't 100% sure what really happened, is to bring his wife to a priest accompanied by a particular offering of barley flour without any oil libations or other normal spices. The offering is described as something which, quote, reminds of sin, whatever that might mean. She is then placed before God, presumably somewhere in the tabernacle. The priest puts some water in a vessel and mixes it with earth from the floor of the tabernacle. Her hair is unbraided and uncovered, and she holds the barley flour offering while the priest holds the water mixture. The water is now described as bitter for some reason. The priest then makes her proclaim an oath of sorts in which she declares that she will be cleansed of the effect of the bitter waters only if she is not guilty of this adulterous act. But if she did, she will be known throughout her people as cursed. The specific curse that will apply to her is unique in the Bible. Nothing like it ever comes up anywhere else. It sounds pretty terrible, but it is unclear what exactly it implies. It says that her curse among her people will be that, quote, her thigh will fall and her belly will blow up. This curse is then written on a small scroll and erased in the bitter waters. The woman then has to drink this water mixed with the earth of the tabernacle and the now erased small scroll. Then the water comes into her and becomes bitter again, whatever that means. After this, the offering is completed and the Torah, for some reason, repeats the procedure with the water and the curse. It does add, however, that if she was innocent, then she will conceive a child. The section concludes with the statement that the husband is not guilty of anything in all this, and that only the woman is responsible for her sin. This all sounds very anachronistic. It is hard to imagine anybody reading this or hearing about it act today actually agreeing that any of this is fair to the woman. Putting all that aside for the moment, we also have to wonder what is really going on here. What is this thing with the water? How does it satisfy, one way or, an, or the other, the doubt and rage going through the mind of the husband? This, after all, seems to have been the necessary precursor for the procedure. He really didn't know what had happened, and he wanted to clear his doubts. Somehow, going through this whole thing clears things up. It does seem that there are two possible outcomes. The second one described is that if the woman was not guilty, she conceives. That's the happy ending. But the first one, the guilty possibility, is pretty vague. What does this water do? Why is it bitter? What is that strange curse of the thigh falling and the belly blowing up? We have no clues whatsoever as to what these things might mean. The classic Jewish understanding is that this is some sort of divine punishment which results in the woman's death. But the problem with this is obvious. There is no indication here of any divine intervention and also no indication that the woman dies. The only result is that the woman will be cursed among her people with this bizarre curse. Perhaps we can suggest something here with the caveat that it is going against Jewish tradition. Perhaps this strange phrase is a biblical expression for some combination of miscarriage and possibly infertility. But how was that supposed to happen? Was this a divine punishment? Perhaps this also can be explained as a result of the psychological effects of the ordeal the woman had been made to undergo. She, of all people other than, than the man she slept with, knew that she was guilty. She knew it. She was put through all this to possibly drive her crazy with guilt. This was the only way to ascertain her guilt. It would only come out if she admitted it somehow. 
This procedure, this strange procedure, gets her to inadvertently do just that. If she was really guilty, her conscience would get to her and would cause her to either miscarry or become barren. If this is correct, then it is a biblical version of the power of the mind over the body. We are quite familiar with this sort of thing. We just don't expect to see it in the Bible. This entire procedure is absolutely foreign to us, and we really don't know what to make of it. But when understood in this way, it makes sense. This procedure could have only worked in a culture that had a certain idea of marriage and the roles of men and women. This image is no longer in vogue, so the procedure wouldn't work today. But back then, it likely would have been perfectly understandable and acceptable. What is common among both our culture and biblical culture is the element of the guilty conscience and what it might do to a person. In spite of all the changes over the millennia, the vast differences between the biblical idea of marriage and that of today, some things have remained. We are still affected by guilt. Let us hope that this is among the things that don't vanish in the rapidly changing future. Shabbat Shalom.